press. But it wasn't until after his death that the novel became as popular as it was. In 1984, that novel sold 50,000 copies a week in the United States. In 1984? In 1984, in the year of, of 1984. Did the fact that the novel exist, existed or, or exists, have any impact on making sure that it really didn't happen? Well, during 1984, there were, you know, of course, a flurry of conferences and discussions about, you know, has the world of 1984 come to pass? And, of course, there were people who said, no, look, at we haven't. And on the other hand, people said, oh, yes, it has. Um, that's a judgment call. I think that uh, in some ways it's far worse than the world that Orwell envisioned. On the other hand, it's not as bad as he envisioned. The events in, in Eastern Europe show us that it is becoming almost impossible to control the information environment as tightly as Orwell envisioned it. The only country I can think of that can do that now is North Korea. They're the only one that is complete. They're hermetically sealed from the rest of the world. Romania is trying to be hermetically sealed, and I don't, don't know how successful they will be. But as the Chinese government found out, the existence of telephones and fax machines and personal computers simply makes it impossible to, to control language and therefore ideas in the way that Orwell saw it in 1984. But I think that what governments have done is they've just gone a step beyond that. They will let the information flow. They will just try and control the way that the content of that flow of information. Now, the George Orwell Award for Distinguished Contribution to Honesty and Clarity in Public Language, uh, Donald Bartlett or Barlett Barlett. and James Steele, reporters for the Philadelphia Inquirer in 88. Yes. Oh, in 88, it was uh, Edward Herman, professor of finance at the, uh, oh, that was 88. That was 89. They did a series of articles in the Philadelphia Inquirer on the tax reform bill showing that through false, deceptive language that was inserted in, into the bill, billions of dollars in special tax breaks were given away to individuals and uh, companies and corporations. And it was all done through, through deceptive language that no one knew, understood the language. It was written in such a way that it applied only to one individual. Great example. Um, one business was defined as a family farm in that bill, thereby giving them the special tax breaks for farmers. That business employs 25,000 people and has a gross income of over $1.5 billion a year. The tax bill called them a family farm. 87 was Noam Chomsky for On Power and Ideology. 86 was Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Uh, 85 was Torben Vertergaard and uh, Kim Schroeder. Yeah, they're two Danish uh, uh, professors. And one more, 84, was Ted Koppel, moderator of ABC's television program, Nightline. Mm. Uh, in general, who gives the George Orwell Award, and what's usually the, the reason? Well, the, the Committee on Public Doublespeak of the National Council of Teachers of English, um, we take nominations from, from anybody who wants to give us nominations. We vote. We have 35 members on the committee. They're all teachers of English. We have one statistician and one philosopher on the committee, and we vote. They, what we look for are, is someone who has contributed to clarity in language and public discourse. Nightline, I think, is a good example. Ted Koppel, I think, is famous for saying, wait a minute here, um, can we back up and explain that one for a minute? I mean, he's very good at, at doing that, and we think that that contributes to, to clarity and discourse. Um, we gave it to, uh, to Bartlett and Steele because of, you know, revealing that, that intricacies of that tax law were needlessly done and that the language was deliberately opaque to give special tax breaks to a lot of people and corporations. That's tens of billions of dollars worth. We think that that's important that people know about that, that this language is being used to take money out of their pockets because somebody's going to have to make up for that uh, missing tax revenue. So we're looking for people who contribute to honesty in language, clarity in language that way. Okay, uh, the recipients of the Double Speak Award, same Double. group give out? Yes, the same group. We exactly vote each year and uh, from the nominations that we receive, and we try to give the award to, as a symbolic award, to an American public figure who has used doublespeak that has consequences of some kind on public policy or a public issue. Uh, in 1989, we gave it to Exxon Corporation for calling the uh, 35 miles of shoreline in Alaska environmentally clean. When reporters pointed out that there was still oil all over the place, uh, an Exxon spokesman said, well, Clean doesn't mean that every oil stain is off every rock. It means the natural inhabitants can live there. Let me go quickly through the list uh, through the 80s. 80 was Ronald Reagan. 81 was Alexander Haig. 
82 was the Republican National Committee, 83, Ronald Reagan, 84, the Department of State, 85, the CIA, 86, NASA, 87, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, and 88, Defense Secretary Frank Carlucci, Admiral William Crow, and, William, and Rear Admiral William Fogarty. A political question to you. If someone read that list, they would think possibly that this is a one-sided award to only one side of the political spectrum. Well, for this reason, the, the Republican Party has been in power for eight years. And so, you know, when Jimmy Carter was in, he got it. So, you know, we, these are the people who have the power to affect public policy through their language. Um, as I point out, Democrats don't get quoted too much these days. They're not in power. If they get in power, they'll be right in there in the list with everybody else. I don't see it. I mean, we, we cited uh, Dukakis during his campaign for his doublespeak, which he used. And if he had been elected president, he'd be in the running along with everyone else. Either Republican or Democratic Party better than the other when it comes to doublespeak? No, they both use it. Um, it, it. It seems to go with the territory. Our point is that, uh, as, as Orwell said, it's political language, and political language tends to, in the 20th century, to be this kind of misleading and deceptive language, whether it's uh, Johnson. By the way, the, the legacy from, from the Johnson administration was the language of Vietnam and the language of the poverty program, which stopped calling people poor and started calling them disadvantaged and stop talking about slums and ghettos, but the inner city. I mean, that's a heritage of doublespeak from the Johnson administration. Let me go back to when we started this conversation. I asked you, I think in the beginning, is this done on purpose and with calculation? And you said yes. Yes. In fact, I, uh, the, the, I cite a couple incidents, incidents in the book where I can document it was done. One is revenue enhancement. They had a meeting in the Office of Management and Budget. They said, we need a phrase to replace tax increase. They came up with revenue enhancement. When uh, Lawrence Kudlow, the economist, uh, was asked why they did that, he said, because there's no better way to sell economic policy than the euphemistic route. He was quite proud of the fact that they came up with that phrase. And Peacekeeper, as the name for the MX missile, again, Robert McFarland chaired the committee meeting in which he facetiously suggested that they couldn't name it uh, Widowmaker, could they? So instead, they came up with Peacemaker. But later, President Reagan misread his, his cue cards and said, uh, uh, Peacekeeper. And since it was a televised speech, it became the Peacekeeper. And it was a name that was deliberately designed to make a nuclear missile sound nice. Does it work? Yes. Oh, of course it works. I mean, most people don't hear it. Um, they will hear some of it, but not all of it. One of my favorite examples from this past year is the resource development park that they were going to establish in Kansas City until the good folks uh, in the neighborhood where they were going to put the park asked, what is a resource development park? Do you know what a resource development park is? In Kansas City, it's a dump. They were going to put a dump in their neighborhood until somebody asked what it meant. They deliberately invented that phrase to try and slip a dump into the neighborhood without anyone noticing it until it was too late. We have just have a short time left, and, and there are a number of things that uh, our audience may be interested in. I've got here in my hand the quarterly review of doublespeak. Is there an organization that you can join if you want to get into this? Deeply? You don't have to join. You can just subscribe to that. In fact, most of the subscribers are uh, you know, civilian public and not even English teachers. It's uh, $8 a year. It's, it's subsidized by the National Council of Teachers of English. So uh, that's why the cost is so low. Where do you get it? Uh, you can simply write to the quarterly review of doublespeak. Um, uh, in uh, Urbana, Illinois. Is this the, I've got the 1111 yep. Kenyon Road, Urbana, yes. Illinois. Yes. 61801, mm -hmm. National Council of Teachers of English. Mm -hmm. And eight dollars and you're a subscriber and you're a subscriber and what will what will you get out of this uh i edit it you will get all the latest examples of doublespeak that, that are sent to me which i put in there articles on doublespeak uh, uh book reviews on books uh, of interest cartoons uh short pieces on what's the latest in advertising doublespeak and i try to make it fun and funny and interesting and entertaining at the same time you also learn things like how to read public opinion polls so that you're not misled by the results one last question, your favorite doublespeak word or phrase? The Department of Defense, which until 1947 was the Department of War. The book is called Doublespeak, and it's written by William Lutz, published by Harper and Row, in your bookstores.